to everyone I've been seeing, everybody who's joining in from all across the country. I mean, we'll just be here all night if I say every state, but I've been looking at Hawaii, New Jersey, Texas, California, and even across the world. I've seen Canada as well as the Philippines. OMG, thank you, thank you guys. Welcome, welcome. I am Nick Varios and I'm your MC, questionnaire, and host with the most <laughs> for a conversation with Mona May, fabulous costume designer, Mona May. So we are so happy to have you guys here. I hear there's like um, 2,000 RSVPs, if not more. <laughs> so hopefully everybody can get it in. Now, because Mona May is so famous for her iconic 90s movies, I was hoping they'll be like, 1990 attendees. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone to this fabulous conversation. We have so much to get to. And so let's just start off with introducing our fabulous, fabulous guests. So let's go. <laughs> FIDM alumni Mona May. She's been a driving force in the entertainment industry for almost 30 years as the costume designer behind iconic fashion films such as Clueless, <laughs> The Wedding Singer, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, and Never Been Kissed. She's created unforgettable looks for major motion picture movies and TV that have captured the imagination and inspired fashion trends for generations to come. Born in India, did you know? <laughs> Mona was raised in Warsaw and later Berlin. She studied fashion in Europe, New York, and Los Angeles. While in school at FIDM in Los Angeles, Mona began working on music videos and commercials, but her big break came with the 1995's film, Clueless, <laughs> which continues to inspire fashion designers today. She went on to work with The Wedding Singer, A Night at the Roxbury, and Enchanted. Since then, Mona has injected bold confidence into her costume designs across pop culture favorites in film and TV, including The House Bunny, one of my favorites, Santa Clarita Diet, Stuart Little 2, and the upcoming Punky Brewster reboot. Throughout the years, she has appeared regularly on campus here at FIDM as a guest speaker. We are thrilled to once again welcome this fearless storyteller and creator as our guest of honor today. Ladies and gentlemen from across the United States and the world, let's give a warm welcome to Mona May. And here I am. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Mona May. Hi, Hi darling. So nice to see you. It's so awesome. And we've been friends for so long. It's just great to be here. And I'm honored to be interviewed by you. Uh, it's going to be like a fun evening more than anything, you know, just chit chatting with the old friend. Uh, thank you for everybody for coming. I heard there's a lot of RSVPs. I'm super stoked and always happy to talk to everybody and inspire and, you know, uh, share information because I think that's, I mean, I love my job and I just really, you know, it's the, the most amazing things to be able to share uh, my art. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I can't wait to see you in person. I and know. yes, I I absolutely love you because yes, we've been friends for so long and you're always such, such a joy. You're like, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but you're an official gay bestie to me. Forever, <laughs> like a, forever, you know, forever. I miss you know, Because you're an artist. We get along because you're an artist. You know, we have to express ourselves and have fun. Life is too short. Exactly, exactly. I love, love, always look forward to, to seeing you when you, get to the museum exhibitions, the FIDM museum exhibitions. I'm like, where's Mona? Where's Mona? And of course, the minute we don't see each other for a year, but then I we know. see each other there and it was like nothing. Yeah, yeah. it's Completely. like, Completely. I love, I love Completely. dishing with Mona. And now we're going to dish. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Mona. Thank you for oh. being here. And um, again, everybody, it is such a joy to have this inspiring icon of uh, costume design and fashion and, and just as a general, wonderful human being. So let's get to it. Welcome Mona May. Um, now let's start with this. You know, I remember years ago when looking up at your bio and the first thing that came up was like, 
born in India. And I was like, oh, no, she didn't. So we know that you were born in India to European parents and you were raised in Warsaw and later Berlin. You studied fashion in Europe, New York and LA. You have this incredibly rich global perspective. Um, how has that given you a unique point of view um, in terms of, of, of your work? Talk a little bit about that. You know, it's so funny because now we, we talk the global, the global point, the global point of view, you know, we didn't talk like that 20 years ago or when, <laughs> you know, when, when I started working in a business. And I think that uh, part of the success of Clueless really was because I, you know, when I met Amy Herkeling, and we can talk about it later when you ask me about the movie, the director, I met on another project it was a TV show uh, that we did a pilot for and we just creatively just were completely in sync. And when she, you know, wrote Clueless, she was like, I want Mona May because like we just were completely creatively, you know, compatible. Uh, I mean, almost like besties bring the same tear sheets, you know, from magazine to the set. That's and, one, you hit it off, you hit it you off. You completely clicked. hit it off, you know. So when she wrote Clueless, she really, you know, called me up and said, I want you to do this film because you grew up in Europe and, you know, the girls dress in European fashions, you know, it's all high fashion from the runways. And I think, you know, the, the living in those different places all over the world, at that time, before we even had the coined, you know, global point of view, right. I had the global point of view because I think that, the, again, the success is that the clothes are not stuck in America. They're not stuck in that 1995. I mean, the most amazing thing to me is that when you look at this film now and how current the fashions are, and yeah. I, because it is something that's almost like transcendental, you know, it's, it's, it's the pieces that you love, it's the peacoat, it's the, you know, it's the beret, it's the shift dresses, the empire dresses with the cap sleeves, it's stuff that's timeless, always, right. stuff, you know, fits women great, fits, makes girls feel very, very confident and feminine, which is kind of what I really, you know, I'm all about. <laughs> um, so I think that was incredible to have that in my back pocket in a sense, you know, and that always I think has stayed with me. And I think part of also maybe being born in India is colors. And maybe this is the experience of being bored, born there and, you know, opening my eyes and outside is like LA almost, you know, there's bougainvillea, fuchsia and yellow. Right. You know, when I lived in Poland, it definitely is not that kind of climate. It's more gray. I mean, there's- It's the opposite, there. right? It's the opposite. It's kind of so the opposite. I never yeah. thought about that, that possibly, that you're, you're, you're growing up in India, being born there and just walking out the door and seeing the, 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 the shot, the jolts of color. Yeah. But then 20 years ago, it's not by happenstance that all of a sudden Miss Mona May loves color. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And I, you know, I've, I mean, if you come to my house, you've been to my house, you know, there's color yeah. everywhere. I mean, I, right. you know, my glasses, my hat, my, you know, I have my pins. I, I, to me, color is energy. You know, I talk a lot about that when I, when I teach, because, you know, when, when we get to the clueless and the yellow suit, you know, the energy of that color, it will not, you don't arbitrarily just pick up a jacket and, and, you know, everything to me has energy. Red has energy. What does it say on the screen what, when somebody's wearing it? blue? You know, all of that when we as humans, I mean, there's even, you know, very a uh, lot of um, research uh, where they can heal with color, you know, mm -hmm. the color is healing. They, they even paint rooms in hospitals in a certain color for people to, you know, get better. Uh, I mean, we talk about, you know, looking at the world in roses glasses, rose glasses, you know, uh, happy. So to me, it's all energy. And I, I think all of that has given me and I think then, you know, being living in kind of a communist country and then living and you know, I, I lived there when I was a kid. And then as a teenager, I moved to Berlin in the 80s, you know, so then I got exposed to this very oh. different world, you know, that was wow. kind of yeah. edgy and dark and interesting. And, you know, it's funny how also when you look at my career is kind of interesting because I, you know, I started with the very bright things and Clueless and Romy and Michelle and everyone's kids to, you know, wedding singer. And then I got an opportunity to do something very dark, which is a movie called Eight Millimeter with Nick Cage. Yes, and, yeah. And, and it's so, you know, interesting because I kind of became the girl go-to for comedies and, you know, female-driven uh, pictures. And I was lucky enough to meet a director who really was about being an artist. And he saw mm -hmm. the artist in me, you know, and kind of after we talked and I told him where I'm from and what I, you know, who I was, he really had the confidence to hire me for the dark film. So then I can, I can showcase also the dark part of me. That part of you, right, right. I mean, 
because I think as, as really looking at someone's career, I think, you know, in acting or any kind of profession in the arts, you can kind of get slotted into, oh, she's the comedy girl, you yeah. know, even for actors or they are the dramatic actors or whatever. So I really try in my work to be very versatile, to really have fun, to learn. It's all about learning for me. So doing a movie like that eight millimeter going from this very bright world into a very dark, I mean, it was about the snuff film, you know, it was a very dark mm -hmm. movie. There was almost zero color, but there was still a lot of depth. And then, you know, when I was able to, to move forward with like doing um, Haunted Mansion, which was period, you know, which was kind of masquerade balls and stuff. Right, and, right. Yes, and then I got to do and go into um, uh, Enchanted, you know, and Stuart Little. Stuart Little was really my first movie where I started doing CGI and, and learning about mm -hmm. CGI, you know, and, and dress the, the digital mouse, you know, and here. <laughs> right, and right. It was so much fun, you know, learning. And then from that movie, I was able, I was hired on Enchanted, which was really interesting too, because it was a live action animation and then CGI characters. All of, all of those things combined, yeah, right? So I, think it's, I think it's wonderful. Like you said, I think a lot of costume designers, I know um, having, you know, being uh, with Fidham for so long and, and being the spokesperson for the museum and the exhibitions, as well as the co-chair uh, for those departments, I've learned a lot of costume designers, like you said, get pigeonholed like, oh, you know, they're the go-to for period films or they're right. the go-to for cont right. contemporary. And I, I love that you your your CV your curriculum vitae right. is 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 so very so you know what let's just speaking of movies let's just think, get, let me, let's just get to Clueless okay one more thing I just want to yeah. tell everyone that I think that in a way you have to fight for that that you have to uh, really consciously make that effort because I think yes. it's very easy to get these jobs I mean I get called for all the you know female driven comedies and all those right. kind of stuff but I think as an artist and all the you know everybody who's listening, I think, you know, you have to kind of go out of your uh, comfort zone because, you know, when I got the movie Stuart Little, I'd never done CGI. Mm. I, you know, I was trusting myself that I will know what to do, that I will learn and I'll have the help. And then the director also hired me because of my artistry and what I can bring to the table, you know, so certain kind of confidence and getting out of the comfort zone to learn more, to express yourself as an artist. You know, I think that, um, we can get scared or, you know, well, maybe it's not for me. You know, I think reaching for the stars and kind of literally reaching for something that you dream of and, mm -hmm. and you know, through maybe, you know, obstacles and, and sometimes you have to fall down. And, you know, I've, I haven't gotten certain movies that I really wish I would have designed, you know, that's okay. Uh, I've done movies where, you know, I thought it was beautiful work. By the time they finished, the movie was horrible. And you're like, <laughs> right, right. Because, you know, nobody's going to see it. But so much of my work and heart went into it. So, you know, it's not about always the end result, but your kind of journey as an artist, you know, and that's kind of what I try to express in all of my life and work. You know, it's kind of like a journey of who I am, you know, my, my moods, my experiences, my learning. And each movie to me, it's a really great learning experience, you know, whatever that is, learning CGI, meeting different actors, working with different director of photography, uh, directors, you know, especially because you get to so close to them. And I think, you know, in, in a lot of, I don't know, you know, I've never worked in like an office, but on the set, it's so important to have these relationships, you know, it's about kind of communication, you know, it's, it's, we are artists, you know, so it's kind of like mm -hmm. a family that you become together on a film and you really, you get very close. And I think that learning is also wonderful because I learn from other artists, you know, as well. So, you know, it's not a process of sitting at home and painting. It's really a process of being with others, you know, and right. co-creating. I mean, I get the script, you know, I see the director, he tells me his idea, you know, of the script, but then I have the production designer and the sets and, you know, what couch they're going to be on. I mean, all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. So, so all of that has to be because if, if I don't know and you know the actor works on this walks on the set in a green top and it's a green couch we disappear and then they're gonna disappear <laughs> gonna disappear and then you're creating also stress because then they have to wait for us I have to take the actor and change them now they're feeling uncomfortable you know so all of that I mean my job is really not only creating the look for the film and you know all the genius ideas that you know we can um, translate into costumes and tell the story but it's really you know, taking care of the actors and being kind of mom to them. And, you know, a lot of them have a lot of insecurities. And there's a lot of therapy. You, you probably uh, could, could have gotten a degree in, in, in psychology. I did. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> 30 years. I, I have, right. PhD. I have PhD. <laughs> yeah, no, no. 
I can imagine the actress like, oh, I feel fat. And you're like, no, oh. honey, you are, you are perfect. There's nothing wrong with you. Like how many times do you have to- Oh my God. You know, yeah, yeah. Like when, when the double zeros come in and they want to be triple spanked and you're like, okay, <laughs> I guess we have to do it. It's, you know, I want to make you feel comfortable. But the, but the process too, it's so beautiful when you really are in, in the fittings with actors, you know, you have to kind of allow them to be there. And I love that process as well. You know, how do you really um, manage someone's personality and what they like and certain kind of likes or dislikes of the clothes and how to, can you create the character with them to get out of their own personality, you know? And that's a job of a costume designer. I think the most beautiful thing to me is when, you know, you look at a film, you look at the frame and somebody comes up on the frame and within, literally 10 to 15 to 20 seconds maximum you know exactly who they are by what exactly they are. right you don't even have to open their mouth well that's that's i i always say that is the sign of an of, of a good costume designer when when you you're watching the tv show or the movie and like you said they don't even open the mouth and then you're like yeah that's a secretary or that's a diva yeah. or, or, that's he's, a or he's depressed or he's or, depressed or he's, or, depressed, or he's, oh, happy, exactly. or he's like, a sexy girl or whatever that right, is. exactly yeah. just by yeah. the wardrobe and i think the if, if the fact that you that it seems seamless and natural that you don't even question it and that is when i think a costume designer such as yourself have, have done their job yes. you know because yes. i always say on paper when you read a book the writer describes the you know uh, the character and what they're wearing and what they what they look like what their hair is their makeup and but yet in a movie you can't describe the way you describe it is with what Mona May with the visual the costumes and yeah. that's how you're describing who they are all right can we let okay. we gotta get to clueless let's because do it let's do it let's do it let's do let's get to clueless uh, 2020 mark the 25th anniversary of clueless and yes it's 2021 so we're continuing the 25th anniversary it's 25 plus right Mona May? yes 25 darling. plus anniversary now i read that uh clueless had one of the lowest budgets wardrobe budgets at of the time um coming in at a measly quote unquote two hundred thousand dollars and then i read that there were 63 outfits and so somebody when just I was for share it, hello right just that's for, for share. share well get this so I, that, I guess that whoever wrote this didn't understand because then they tried to do the math and they said two hundred thousand divided by 63 that's three thousand per outfit and i'm like that's not the entire film y'all no. right bona no no so honey. share had just how share. many outfit changes i think 63 and then you had Dion, and then you had Ty, and then right. Amber, and then you had every extra that was on the screen had to Thank be Tell them, preach, preach. Hello, I, preach. I mean, look at the gym scene, you guys. You can remember the gym scene? I love that scene. I mean, everybody's head to toe. The boys that, you know, walking down with the low pants. I mean, right. imagine we have created, and again, this is what I do too in my work. You know, I create the color palette. I can create a whole world. So when somebody's coming like a BG extra person in the morning in their clothes, maybe they bring a couple of things. They may probably 99% don't have what we need, what the color palette, what the world. And right. We look at, again, the movie, let's say share every all the girls are dressed and then all the people be around them looking shabby you would right. believe that they will live in beverly hills that everybody has money and you know <laughs> you have all the different cliques and all, all the different pe people yeah i said i i remember something about you saying that you wanted them to resemble that you know the character the girls especially to resemble mall rats and not models um explain that and then when you say about mall rats i want to no, know what mall was, no, it was actually models and oh, models, wow. it was, it, this is something that actually I discussed a lot with the director, Amy Heckling, uh -huh. she, you know, when she wrote the script, she wanted to make sure that the, the high fashion that we're going to put her in, that they don't right. look like snooty models, <laughs> they really look like, you know, a, a cute young girls, right. you know, we never used high heels, there was Mary mm -hmm. Jane's, you know, even the over mm -hmm. the knee was kind of sweet, the right of the length of the skirt, you know, I mean, it was, it's funny when people ask me if this movie was remade now i almost feel like i don't know if it could be because the innocence of the time without the phones without the kind of overexposure you know i think that's what's so charming about the girls it's right kind of innocence even dion who was you know in her kind of vinyl skirts and sexy it's yeah. still not even i mean you know it's it's 
it's very tame compared to what we have now. <laughs> no, yeah, of course. Did you go to, did you use any specific mall as a, as research? Did you, did you visit the Beverly Center or uh, I mean, Sherman course, Oaks? We were, we were everywhere. We were everywhere. I mean, Sherman Oaks, of course. Uh, right. But I think, you know, when we started researching the movie and it was 1994, we went, we went to the high schools here in, in the Valley. Everybody was grunge. Everybody um, was grunge, you know, it's right. kind of insane. It's the, we didn't know girl is a boy, boy is a girl. You right. Know, had the big shirts, the big the androgyny pants. look, the whole androgyny Mark Jacobs, you know, the hair was terrible. Grunge. And I think that's what's so cool about the film and kind of bringing the fashion from Europe and bringing something so kind of heightened and fresh and new to 1995 when people like wow we can be you know especially for girls we can be girls look it's like <laughs> so cool again bring the femininity kind of bring you know who we are as women i think that you know to me i'm like a champion you know i, I work with drew barrymore and all those girls who are so like that um oh i love the yellow suit yeah the, the yellow, yellow, so yellow so let's talk about that. that yellow now it's uh it was gaultier right it was jean paul gaultier it was the lower line which was the junior jean paul oh gaultier. the junior well junior, junior. but still and high, high red. Red. and you know for the money that i had i couldn't buy all designers i had to be so smart what am i going to buy designer what am i going to like you know make right. a future from now right um but let me talk about this yellow because we started talking about color and i think what's so important about this suit and now being so iconic the process of it when we were in the fitting with Alicia we had all the different so we knew you know it was quintessential Catholic school girl uniform but how <laughs> yeah. Cher does it right so now Cher is going to take the plaid skirt and turn it into this beautiful suit right in her own way so I had I had a red suit I had a blue suit I had the yellow one and you know I was like so stuck I was like oh she's going to look so beautiful in the blue ah. and <laughs> because we had to discuss where is she going to be. This is first day of school. She's in the quad, so it's a lot of greenery behind it because it's California. A lot of people crossing. Mm -hmm. So it had to pop. When we put mm -hmm. the blue suit on her, she looked beautiful, but it didn't pop. It was pretty. Right. So we put the red suit on, very Christmassy, not right. Ah. We put the yellow on. I mean, literally, when she when she stopped dressing, we all went. Oh, this is it. This is the that was it. It was like a spotlight. Sunshine. Spotlight. Like a spotlight the red, on her. Sunshine, the yellow, there she comes. I'm the queen. You know, it's so <laughs> interesting. Again, it's the color and how it, you know, we can't just arbitrarily pick the color or pick the outfit. It's everything that's happening, you know, in the film around it. And then I got to design Dion's that was Monome original. And we ordered the hat from a fabulous designer, a head designer, a millionaire in New York City, Cocken, who still is in business. Wow. Wow. Now, what is the inspiration? I know, but I want you to tell everybody. What was the inspiration for the hat? Well, a little bit of Dr. Seuss in the movie. <laughs> a little bit of Dr. Seuss, but it's very Chanel, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. it's all about Chanel. I mean, the girls, it was all designer, you know? And I think that's so cool too at the time. People really talked about designers, like people talk now. Not everybody knew the Instagram and the right. you know, style.com. So this movie was really an education. I mean, Alaya, I think Alaya, who was the designer, which, you know, high fashion people knew in France yeah. and Paris and maybe New York and LA, but most people, kids who went to see the movie didn't know Alaya. Alaya names, I think really became kind of known from mm -hmm. the movie. You right, know, so the red the red dress, right? That she wore. When she, get, no. when she gets, you know, when she gets hold up, what is it? No. It's an Did Alaya. You buy that? Did you buy that? No, I didn't have the money. It was land, but in the time in the time too, you don't have PR firms. I had to like track it down, call wow. Paris. I had to also tell them that she may be on the ground. I mean, we were basically licking the ground to make sure the dress doesn't get damaged. Oh. You know, so we can return it. It was oh. different times, you know. I mean, you didn't have the PR machine where you're just calling like Sex in the City. They can call right. everybody, and within days there's boxes. You know, I also had unknown actors. I, you know, I had ingenues. I mean, Alicia right. was in a first movie. She was only in a music video before. I mean, this is so cool, you guys. Like, for example, you know, here comes Alicia Silverstone, first movie. She's already a hippie. She's like a, you know, she wants to save the world. She's <laughs> vegan at 18. And she comes in her sweatpants and she comes super like, you know, casual with her dogs and tell that she just rescued. And here we have to put her in all this high fashion. 
It was an incredible education for her to start putting these clothes. You know how she says in the movie, clothes are so binding. I mean, this was almost <laughs> like for Alicia Silverstone. She had to learn how to wear these clothes, right. you know, to really understand fashion. I mean, it's funny because even many years later, you know, we were at the uh, Hollywood Cemetery. It was a maybe five years ago was maybe the the, fifth, the 20th anniversary and we were both invited. Uh, she opened the film, I was there and you know, she sat down, her son was there first time seeing the movie and she said to me, Mona, you know what? I just never understood how much, what the clothes were and how important they were and what it really was, you know? Right. Was so young. Um, and she was tortured. I mean, 63 changes. Imagine how many fittings. Oh were. my goodness. <laughs> and, and like you said, I didn't really know, didn't realize that I mean, it made it. She made it so natural and seamless. Like, oh, of course she would put that on. But in in her own right as a person, this the, this wardrobe would be the last thing that she would be wearing. You know, and it's funny you mentioned about the the high fashion, the designers. I think a lot of people don't realize that back in the '90s, you were either there was no high low like now, right, Mona? Man? You know how now you can you mix the Zara with the or H and M with. And nine hundred dollar Balenciaga sneakers. Completely. But back in the day, you were either designer or grunge or not. Yeah. Um, and this I, movie, and this movie was really the first time that people got to see this right. because we saw, you know, the high end mixed with the low end. And it's funny because I really didn't have. It was mother of invention too, in a sense, because I didn't have the money. I had to be smart. I had to be. <laughs> cool. I had to get it from the mall. I had to get it from the designer. I mean, a lot of the young stuff is thrifted. You know, the, like, and then some stuff from Melrose, like remember uh, that rave store, Bowls, something. I mean, they were like, yes, like, yeah, yeah. You know, like, so I really had to go far to find mm. these pieces, you know, and really wow. make it. And then you have, you know, Amber. I mean, look at her with all her, you know, glory of like being a sailor. Right, like, right. Keep you long stocking, you know, <laughs> that. And that's humor, you know, I think bringing humor into into clothing and fashion is always great. I think it's it's charming and, you know, delights people. Wonderful, wonderful. Now let's talk about the the your wonderful collaboration with uh, Thrilling. Uh, yes. You did a collaboration with the online vintage store Thrilling, um, and we have some photos right here. Now for the 25th anniversary, now we're just continuing the 25 plus anniversary of Clueless. You teamed up with Thrilling, shopthrilling.com on a Clueless vintage inspired collection, Thrilling X Mona May collab. There's an explosion of color, celebration of personality, unexpected mixing of match and matching of patterns and styles. It's signature Mona May. Now guys, speaking of color, by the way, uh, our spring virtual open house event is coming up in March 20th when we're gonna talk about color. So don't forget to put that in your calendar, everybody. Check your email. Now let's get back to this collaboration. Tell me how this started, obviously. I'm assuming it had to do with the 25th anniversary and what your involvement uh, was in, in putting together these clothes. It was so cool, you guys. It's one of those things, you know, I mean, I love I love Instagram and I'm embracing it because somebody reached out to me, DM me and they were like, we love your work. And we just, this online, you know, um, collaboration of, of small businesses. Uh, the business is owned by an African-American woman, a woman. Uh, you know, really uh, was championing the sustainability, you know, and really reusing clothes, you know, vintage. And I just couldn't say no. You know, it was really <laughs> an opportunity. I love, you know, I mean, I'm the girl's girl. So I want to, you know, I want to inspire. I want to support women's business and also small businesses. And I think we have to think vintage. You know, I think that what's happening in the world right now, you know, how much there is just piles of clothes from H&M and Forever 21 somewhere, you know, we need to look into dressing like this, you know, and coming also from Europe, you know, when you actually bought a piece of clothing that was, that lasted a really good coat, right. really good boots, you know, I'm really into it. So this was so incredible to you guys. This is all vintage. This is not one piece here that's not vintage. And I didn't really have time to prep. We just kind of shopped around and a couple, couple of vintage stuff in LA. They shipped some stuff. I told them what I'm looking for. And on a day, we basically shot for five hours. I just styled, I went Mona May all the way. <laughs> the best best uh, girls you know we have all sizes you know we have all colors I mean it's like I love my model that you know she can be size 16 and look at her you know she could pull it off so beautifully um 
so I, I, I encourage everybody really to do it. And it was such a huge success, you know, it really just sparked so many responses from newspapers and magazines. And uh, because I think sometimes you don't see vintage this way. I think you see it, but it's kind of like, it's a retro. This right. is vintage in, in completely modern way. But I said, that's, that's exactly what I was gonna say, because like you said, each of these garments that we're looking at, that everybody's looking at, they are from the 90s or 80s, and, and but look 40s how fresh. Even. Yeah, 70s, 40s, 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 all eras, yeah. 40s. But look how fresh and how current and how now they look. I mean, I know a lot of it has to do with the styling, uh, you know, but at the same time, that also is a testament to those garments. I know that we're definitely having a 90s moment uh, right. in 2020, 2021, but yeah. just look at these clothes and how fresh they look, you know, so... Um, yeah, uh, buy, buy vintage. <laughs> I'm buy vintage and go to Trilling, you guys. I mean, you're supporting, you're supporting small businesses. You're supporting the earth. You're supporting, you know, black owned business. I mean, all of it. It's like, I think we have to get involved. You know, this is the, this is the time now to be like yeah. you know, good humans and help each other. For sure. What did, speaking of designers, what did you think? I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, um, a little known designer um, named Donatella Versace uh, had a collection and it was all plaid. And I remember everybody, all the, all the fashionista editors were like, clueless, clueless, clueless. I know. Uh, <laughs> what was your, what was your take? Were you like, oh honey, pass the, pass the salt. <laughs> I just love it. I mean, I, I think, you know, any, anything that has to do with plaid and clueless and me, Right. I, I welcome it because, you know, it just lives on. And, it, you know, yeah. and I think that it really makes people happy. I mean, who doesn't like a plaid? Who doesn't like a plaid skirt? Who doesn't like a plaid jacket? You know, I mean, hey, plaid pants, I love, you know, like so yeah. kind of punk rock and stuff. I mean, Zara just had the most beautiful red pair of uh, plaid pants. They were super skinny, high-waisted with zippers. I, I put them in uh, uh, Punky Brewster. I put them in the movie I'm working right now. I bought a pair. So, you know, <laughs> that is it. <laughs> I agree. Do you know that when I was a student at FITM, both Mona May and myself, we were both, we're both alumni of FITM. And when I was a student back in 1984, um, yes. uh, one of the first garments I made were pants. And I went to downtown, got some cheap fabric because that's all I could afford. And I bought all, the only fabric I bought were like four different versions of plaid. And it was like a polyester plaid and I made myself some pants. And I just wore them with like a 90s oversized, you know, gap t-shirt. But right. everyone and their mother, to this day, I still remember, everybody would always be like, where'd you get those pants? Where'd you get those pants? This sort of emotion, and like you've been talking about, I think it's a, it's a thread of Mona May and your, your, your costumes, your designs, that it, it evokes emotion, but yeah. what the prints, the colors, what that does, you know, not many people would are gonna look at a, a black dress and be like, that black, oh my God, right, right, <laughs> you know? right. Right. Um, I right, think it just right. it, it evokes emotion. All right, so now we've gone about clues. Because you know, you know what the word is? It's about the light. I just yes. want people to be delighted. I just want them to right. come out and feel good. And I mean, it's like, you know, I have, this girl just came into a, a, to my wardrobe room the other day. She's a second AD, so she works on set, but she is, you know, younger here in Vancouver. And she's like, oh my God, I love the clothes. And then she found out he did clues and she just was like, you know, I mean, it was so cute. And it's like, she's like, Aww. I just love your movies. You know, it makes me <laughs> happy. And I mean, who doesn't like to hear that, that something has kind of, you know, changed someone and uplifted them. And I mean, especially now when we are at home and we are in COVID, you know, it's like, wow, can, can we go to these things mm -hmm. that, that delight us, you know? So when I work hard and I have the 14 hours and I have to be in Vancouver and it's very cold here right now. It's, <laughs> I think about that. That's my art. I mean, that's kind of what I, you know, I'll walk the 10 miles up here in the snow because I care so much. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Let's talk about a little, a little bit about your other iconic films. You know, after Coolest, you went on to design costumes, as we know, for Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, A Night at the Roxbury. You see right there, The Wedding Singer. You've had a 20 plus year collaboration with actress, producer, Drew Barrymore, The Wedding Singer, Never Been Kissed, and the co zombie comedy series, <laughs> The Santa Clarita Diet, which I remember it was at the Fitta Museum uh, yes. um, in one of the exhibitions that we had 
there too. So to, um, tell us, I mean, if you can, is there any of the ones that I've mentioned that, uh, you know, was a favorite of yours? Like uh, talk to us about a favorite, other than Clueless, um, a favorite film or TV project that you've worked on. It's like asking mother, which kid is the I favorite. know, I, I knew, can't, I knew. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. I mean, I love them for each for different reasons. I mean, right. I love Roman and Michelle because it was like, now I got to play with adult women. I got to really push the envelopes. Mm. I mean, they were going clubbing. They were really, you know, they're making their clothes. I mean, it was really, really beautiful. And also working with comedians is very cool because, you know, Lisa Kudrow really, you know, they really get into the character is there's no vanity at all in a sense. You know, right. so it was really, really fun to kind of get into it with, with women who really cared and really got into their character completely. Um, and again, I could kind of keep that color, you know, keep that fun and do something mm -hmm. very different. For example, there, if you look at their uh, outfits in the gym, there was now you have all the new cool gym outfits everywhere. Right. We made the gym outfits because there was nothing out there. You know, <laughs> it was like sailor gym outfit or, you know, the bright, shiny, crazy uh, spandex. Yeah, this is pre uh, Juicy Couture sweat Completely, pants. yeah, you know, so like, again, just, inspiring girls do something really fun you know and wear crazy boas and uh i mean this is the same story where where the clothes you know explain who the character is from beginning till end you know who they are and right kind of also in their lives how fashion changed them you know when you look at these outfits these are uh that are posted you know those are iconic outfits this is what they made this is their designs you know so yeah. I get into their heads and you know what would be what would Rami and Michelle really do and of course you know Lisa Kudra outfit always was in pink so we had to do the boa you know Mira's character was much more like the smarty one you know so she had right. the face thing in blue you know more for a boy she was you know the smarty pants in the relationship and funny story about this you know the we, I, I was thinking about other designs and maybe a week before we started shooting Lisa came and wanted to see her outfit we kind of had a little bit of a change to what it is now and Lisa actually suggested that the dresses are identical Wow. Anyway, at the beginning, I think, oh, she's jealous of the other one, you know, this right, one really happens. Right. but in the end, you know, that slight suggestion, because the, the dress, previous dress that I was designing was a little bit longer, had a little bit of cap sleeves, and when we made them identical, it was something that is, again, that feeling of iconic, this is something so them, you know, it's the party dress, uh, something that they designed, that they feel comfortable as who they are. And kind of that's the also theme in my movies, you know, kind of the journey of the women, like even you looking at Clueless or Never Been Kissed, especially, you know, Romy and Michelle, how do you change? And of course, House Bunny, your favorite. <laughs> it's the journey of the women, you know, it's kind of like coming of age in a sense, finding themselves, you know, so in, in the end, the outfits that express them is who they really are. You know, it's right. kind of the beauty of it. I mean, I love Never Been Kissed because maybe that's one of my favorite films for the story and how costumes really show the journey of hers. You know, you meet mm -hmm. her, she's bookish, ugly hair and kind of, you know, cool odds and horrible colors. Right. And, then, you know, she goes to school undercover. She crazy, she thinks she wears these cool outfits with the boa and the white pants and, you know, horrible lemon, lemon bag. <laughs> and then she's kind of changing, you know, and when you see her at the end, she's w gone through this journey and, figured out that she's okay that maybe the way she is 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 fine perfect right so you see her at the end scene when she's in this beautiful um i designed this you know very very soft pink chiffon dress for her with a kind of a lower neckline we never saw her in that lower neckline very right. sexy, but pretty again very feminine with the little cap sleeves again empire waist which i like because it's so slimming and here she waiting for the guy to come and kiss her you know and this is now she's the kind of vulnerable she's she is a woman now no longer mm -hmm. the child no longer the person kind of searching here i am you know right this is me this is me this is me yeah and i think that's what's so beautiful about a lot of the films that i get to do i'm actually working on one now here in vancouver called mixtape and it's set in the 90s it's about a 12 year old girl who finds a mixtape of her parents so that parents. is why ladies and gentlemen mona may is in vancouver <laughs> in, with us now i want to ask is that are those some of the costumes 
behind you? Some of the wardrobe? Some of it, yeah. Some of the crazy stuff we're going to use. Whoa. One of the things is Harajuku influence. Uh, you know, it's, and again, we have a club scene, of course. We're going to have fun. We have high school scene. They go to school. So we have, you know, a lot of kids in the school. Yeah, it's going to be super fun. I love that back. I mean, uh, that yellow, uh, I don't, uh, the, I, I, yeah, that, right, yeah, yeah, that one. You need love to, I, I will, I will give you, I will text you my address and um, <laughs> you can send me that. Yes, I will perfect. wear that with skinny black jeans. It'll be perfect. <laughs> love it, you know, love it. Just love it. perfect. Uh, now a little bit, talk about the animation. I know you brought it up with Stuart Little 2, Enchanted and the Haunted Mansion because I'm sure, I mean, what made, like you said, you you didn't, you had never really done animation in all of us. And, you know, Mona May's like, hey, why not? Right. So how no, do you but, costume, that's, but that's not how, how I do, do that? But that's not how I think. It's like, <laughs> I, I think more of the design. So when I got the script, it wasn't like, I'm going to, you know, redo the world. I thought about the mouse. And when you see the Stuart little one, the mouse always wears a suit and a bow tie. And that's what's kind of introduction to the world right. uh, of him. So I think they kind of wanted to keep it very simple. So people believed in the story. The movie made like millions and millions, 500 million, mm. I don't know how many millions. So they decided <laughs> to do the sequel. I didn't do the number one. So when I got, a, when I got the script, I was like, okay, what could be cool and new and different about this one? I'm gonna give Stuart a makeover. <laughs> So I went for the interview and I brought sketches who, uh, by our fabulous Felipe Sanchez, who always helps me out. So we, we worked on some sketches for the, for the meeting with the director. And I drew a steward in a Prada suit. I, I drew a steward in a, like a skateboarding outfit. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember which one was the third. And I brought there to the meeting and the director was stunned, you guys. He was like, oh, steward <laughs> takeover, we, cool clothes. <gasps> Sounds amazing. <laughs> That's how I got the job. And now wow. I probably beat people who are maybe more experienced. I mean, that was early in my career because I came from the design, you know, I, and then, yeah. was, yes, I want Stuart to look like he went to the Gap. And, you know, like if you look at the t-shirts and his skateboarding outfit and his helmet, and if you look at his jeans and hoodies, you know, and what's so cool about animation is you take the costume of a human, you put it on the scale of a, whatever the character is. He was four mm -hmm. inches and, and it's only digitally. The costumes are never made in real fabric. But you mm -hmm. create the fabric in animation. So it looks like real fabric and it's not a scanning thing, which I thought then it's a mathematical, mathematical equation. And then you age it. So then you, they have guys who are like paint the fabric, wow. and, paint the fabric and put the stitches on. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There is a scene in the in a um, movie where he like works on the airplane and he kind of like you know does this to your shirt uh -huh. and do the oil. So we even had to give him a little paw prints. What would be wow. the paw prints that he did? So you know it's 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 a great film for me because also I got to do the live action for it as well and dress Gina Davis, who is an incredible actress. You know, she's like six foot tall. She's, she does archery, she has big shoulders. So I also kind of give her makeover as well. Mm -hmm. In the first movie, she was very boxy. She wore like boxy suits. I kind of, you know, I gave her a little bit of Jessica Rabbit look, you know. I right, right. Big shoulders, I cinched her things. I gave her a little padded bra too. And look at the coat, you know, it's very 40s. So that actually was a contemporary coat that was Prada that year. And I just got my hands on it. And I was like, this is perfect. And Gina also has the most incredible skin tone. She has neutral skin. So it's not yellow, it's not pink. So she can actually wear the yellow and chartreuse and green. And right, green. right. Really incredible. I mean, if you, this movie has a very specific color palette, incredibly jewel toned New York City spring color palette. It's beautiful to watch actually how everything kind of, look at her coat, look at kind of how every, the glove, the scarf, everything is just, I, I, it's so true. I didn't even think about, you know, her alabaster skin does tend oh. to go well with, with the colors, like you said. And I love this story a little, you made him, you gave him streetwear before it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you gave him streetwear. And now you're working on, well, you're, you're doing the reboot for Punky Brewster, um, yes. which is on Peacock TV as well. Yeah. 
um, and this is with Enchanted. We see Enchanted right here, which you yeah. also did. Yeah, and and that Enchanted was amazing, you guys, too. Haunted Mansion was cool because it was like ghosts and I could do all kinds of different things. And there is a, um, how much time do we have? Do we have time to talk about it or? We have, we have a little bit, just a okay. little bit of time. So then we can get, by the way, everybody, anybody who has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And we're going to get to some of your questions at the end. So we have a little bit of time. Yeah, just a couple minutes. Talk about it, Mona. Yeah, because yes. Haunted Mansion was really cool. There was also something very new to me because uh, it was a lot of visual effects. And if you go to the next page, um, the director asked me to create, you know, there is a whole uh, sequence of uh, going to the graveyard and the ghosts, which is in mm. the room. So the director wanted something very organic. He did not want to do CGI ghosts. So I actually came up with this kind of a brilliant idea of using scotch light which is this kind of stuff that's in the signs and in your like when you oh, write yes. your machine, yeah it's called scotch light made, made by 3m and the way that it really comes in the form of powder it's microscopic glass beads that are pressed into like fabric or strips or signs and is that what's reflecting in this yes so i took the powder and mixed it with paint and then created the costume sold them and then we actually painted them and then the way that you you film it is with the ring of light around camera so it can reflect right back like if you're driving by a sign right yeah so this was quite fun. And we actually exhibited this at Finn and we had flashlights, the room was dark, it was super fun. <laughs> this was very hard to do because we had to figure out the mixture, how strong, and it, we had to apply it by hand, turn the light off, look at it through the flashlight, see- Check it, 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 and then do it again yeah. until you got it right. You see every detail of the hat, everything was, uh, was done. Um, and then Enchanted, you know, was such an incredible experience to do because it was live action but it started as animation. Mm -hmm. so you had the animated characters turn into human actors. Right. So I had to design the costumes with the animators, like the old Disney animators, and then create wow. them for Amy Adams and all the other characters. I mean, this dress was so incredible, you guys, because the, when you think of, again, proportion, like Stuart talking a little bit about proportion, the animated characters are tiny, right? And if you think of a princess, it's always tiny waist and big sleeves. <laughs> and tiny, yeah. So how do you now make that for Amy Adams running around in, you know, Times Square in New York City? That in she New York City, about? yeah. So this skirt is enormous. It's probably like, you know, 200 yards of fabrics in it. The sleeves are huge, you know, wow. but like a doll. And yeah. it's such a great journey for her as well. When you, you know, she comes in the big dress and then she's learning to be on earth and on, I mean, on our, in our world. And, you know, she's starting to strip the princess, the, the big hair, you know, and as she makes the dress out of a curtain and it's a little bit less. And then she has another dress that's shorter, still very princessy to the moment when she decides to stay on our, in our world and she's at the ball and now it's completely stripped. So there's no more makeup. The, the skin isn't perfect. The hair mm -hmm. is straight. The dress is, you know, completely fitted to her body again. This is who I am. I am me. I am right. Myself. This is me. Right. This is me. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of theme of that in my work. And I think maybe that's why I get called for that, too, because that's important to me. That's a great message, I think, too, to all women all over the world, you know, to feel good in your skin, to wear vintage, to, you know, to be who you are. Um, so I love these films, you know, for that. I think a lot of a lot of your characters were empowered women they were powerful women and you even i think that you added even more power to them through wardrobe you know right. i know as a fashion designer a lot of people think that you know uh uh you know sometimes that what women wear is too suggestive or it, it can be used against them and you know one of my favorite moments was i think what uh, last year a couple of years ago at the golden globes and it was during the whole harvey weinstein and all the actresses decided, most of them, all of a sudden, appeared on the red carpet with the nude dress, see-through. And it was Weird. unbelievable because they took that, what you would think is that uber sexy, um, you know, kind of a, you, you look like the woman is, is all out. No, 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 no. They, these women wore it as a, as a sign, as a symbol of, I dare you. I dare nice. you to, nice. I dare you to touch me. I dare, I'm daring you. Like I am, I am so strong enough that I can wear this and it's not because I want you to, you know, yeah. <laughs> to go there. Um, I think it's just amazing. Okay, we have a fabulous 
fun little game before we get to your questions. Okay, it's called 90s or now. So let's um, get to it. Let's see, we're going right. Okay, here we go. All right, I wanna play a game with Mona May because she's such the 90s queen. Let's see if she knows, guys. Um, let's see if you guys know. Okay, 90s or now, Mona May? Wow, it really could be now and could be 90s. I mean, it's pretty fabulous. Is it Donatella? It, guys, everybody, anybody know? I'm reading, I'm reading. Does anybody know? All right, no, no, nobody's saying anything. Now, they're saying now, yes, it's now. This right. is Olivier Rustin for Balmain, and it ah. is now. <laughs> but look at the influences, look at the jeans, look at where they hit, right by the belly button, the high waist. Look at the jeans. shoulder pad. The shoulder. Mona May, all right. This play was like, seriously, the, oh, that's 90, bad. Okay, 90, okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, Beautiful. Mona May, nine, oh. 90s or now? I kind of think it's kind of a giveaway here, but. 90s, of course. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Look at the yeah, girls. Naomi, Linda, Carla Bruni. All right, next. 90s that or looks, now, guys? That looks 90s now. 90s or now? That looks now. Now, everybody, I'm reading, I'm reading. People are saying 90s. Let's see who's right. The, our audience, or Mona May, this is 90s, Anna Sui. <laughs> I love Anna Sui. We used a lot of Anna Sui. Her embroidery and her stuff. She's yeah. genius. Look at that. I mean, it's yeah. just love she, it. She, she, every collection was spot on with her. Yeah, look at this. This is kind of around that grunge moment. Anna Sui, Mark Jacobs, obviously. Do we have any more? Any more of the game? Oh, we do. Okay. Mona May, so 90s or you now? You can't answer it. It's now and 90s. <laughs> you can't have both, Mona May. All right. What is it? It's 90s. Do you know who it is? Gautier? No. Look at the look at the eyes. Look at look at how low the skirt is. And the tartan. Galliano. Anybody? Yes, somebody got it already. McQueen. I mean, it's only like Alexander McQueen, oh, the yes. bumps. Remember the bumpster pants? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, this oh, is McQueen. God. So it is 90s. All right. 90s or now? You're killing me. 90s. Mona May. I don't know. I mean, it, listen, I'm, I live this world. To me, it's everything. <laughs> Everybody, let's see what people are thinking. Let's see. They're saying now, now. And yes, I can read. I can read. There's a lot of people that got it right. All right, no, Mona May. Now. Final, which is it? Now. Yes, this is now, and this is Jacquemus, a very fabulous collection during the pandemic, right now in the shutdown. And he had it in some gorgeous outdoors field in France because of, that's what he does. Um, but the shoulders, the oversized jacket, amazing, amazing. All right, let's get to some questions, guys. Let's see now. The top question that everybody wants to know, Mon Ami, is how do you get into the film and TV industry? Give it to them. <laughs> hey, number one, are you really ready to work hard, you guys? Because it's really, you know what, like everybody's like, oh, I want to be in the film industry, I don't want to do costumes. You know what, You this is hard work. I'm at work 12 hour days, you know, sometimes I come home at 10, I don't have the white picket fence and five o'clock dinner with my husband. It just doesn't work that way. So. You have to really choose this career. I think you really have to be kind of like a dedicated person who's just going to give it all because the first few years you have to really probably be a PA, you know, to get into it, to help on a movie, which is like a production assistant. You can work in a wardrobe and learn the ropes. Uh, I think interning once we are not in COVID and we can intern and we can be back to offices and stuff. I think that's a really great way. You know, reach out to designers who you, people who you admire, you know, who you really love their work and, and reach out. I mean, I mentor a lot of people, people write to me and, you know, I have a roster of different groups that I, I teach and, and mentor. And so I think reaching out, again, being out of your comfort zone, they may not, sometimes I'm too busy to return the email, but sometimes I'm not. Uh, I think interning, PAing. Uh, I think working on your own projects. I mean, that's kind of how I started too. I started doing, you know, small music videos and, you know, little plays or, you know, stu I mean, I started really basically with student films. That's kind of how I became a costume designer. I wanted to be a fashion designer. I was studying all over the, you know, world and film and, 
not till I really got here. And, I, you know, my friends were like, hey, you in fashion, can you help us with, you know, we're doing this little thesis. <laughs> I'm like, sure. And that became my passion. And I really, you know, I just started designing basically what I did. You know, I just, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to do set. I didn't want to do be a seamstress i want to really to kind of create the world read the scripts so i think also if you do your own projects you know now there is also so great you can do instagram posts you can share it you can so people can see your work i mean in my time that was not possible i still had a pager in the old day you know in the old <laughs> day. hello i i tell i tell the students yeah your instagram is i mean we like you said we never had that and now that is your resume that is yes. your portfolio yes, yes. We choose you know, I, I was talking to somebody, you know, I worked as a consulting producer for Project Runway and the way we chose who was gonna be on the show was not like nobody sent links to websites anymore. Right. They sent us their right. Instagram page. Right. And right. so that I tell people, especially if you're in a visual design world, start documenting your world and what yeah. you're doing, even yeah. if it's a half, a half done, muslin jacket put it on there you yes know? yes and i think also you know express yourself as an artist so i think it can be anything it's photograph you know it can be color i mean everybody has different way of, like, of expressing their art but if i'm looking at something i'll know what your vibe you know, and that's that's something that I look for. But I think also you have to be dedicated when I'm looking for assistance. And that's usually a big question. You know, you have to be dedicated. You have to really want to do it. You have to be able to get up at five, be on time, yeah. and have car working and not say that you ran out of gas and all that stuff. Yeah. You have to get along. You know, you may not like right. somebody or somebody may be short with you. You have to just kind of take it and learn because, you know, eventually even if you're the boss I'm, you're gonna have another boss like I still have a director I still have a studio I may have somebody who's barking at me too so I have to learn how to live in an environment you know you have to really communicate well you have to kind of you know be a really good all-around person you know maybe if you don't not in the morning person but get in the mood and buy coffee <laughs> get you know, the you, coffee definitely yeah, I always say yeah, that advice like, get the coffee <laughs> yeah all right we've got yeah. another top question um uh, can Mona tell the story of how the dress from the curtains in Enchanted Cake uh, uh, came about? Um, and what uh, was it part of the script that- um, Yes, the... it was part of the script, but okay. it was very interesting because uh, curtains are not wardrobe. Curtains are <laughs> a production designer and he designs the curtains. So it was a very funny story about communicating because he was like an old, old, very established designer in New York City production designer and he kind of wanted a very manly curtains because Patrick Dempsey lives there by himself who knows what happened to the wife and I was like no Amy I have to make the dress out of the curtain Amy Adam is going to wear this dress one third of a movie so it was kind of like negotiating how are we going to put the right fabric as a curtain mm -hmm. now I can make the dress out of you know so it you know I finally won and you know I was prodding but if you really look closely the color of the curtain is a little bit darker that's what on her because Amy needed this more of a vibrant aqua blue to look beautiful mm. her skin tone and he was going more into the olive but yes that's a story behind the scenes but it wasn't a script you know we kind of made fake patterns because <laughs> we didn't really put real patterns people really wouldn't understand them so it was a little bit of a fake pattern of the skirt um, but it was such a beautiful uh, part of the story you know that it was really fun to create that dress and it was kind of beginning of her change as I said you know um, and there's an odd in the dress to a very famous film, and you guys can guess later what that is. Sound of music, <laughs> sound of music. You know, it's like really when she was running through the fields. The so anyway, all, all hidden fields. messages. That's the homage. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever, another question now, this question comes from Nicolene Yonker. How much of you do you infuse into the fashion of your, uh, the characters that you're costuming? Like well, how much of your I mean, everything comes through my brain. So it's all me, right. but not me, my personality. I mean, in a sense, like how I dress, but, but my sensibility, you know, I see my world in a certain way. That's Mona May. I, when I look at the world, this is how I see it. So that's my translation. So each script is translation of, of my point of view in a sense, you know. Um, I think you have to, as a designer, you have to get out of your own skin. Otherwise everything is gonna look the same. That's great. Okay, we have a wonderful question from Vera. What was your most difficult? We talk about how much is your, who's your favorite, how much you love Clueless. 
but what was your most difficult project costume or a, a specific costume that you um, had to design? <laughs> I mean, one of the craziest costume I had to design <laughs> was the Prince in Enchanted because he had these huge sleeves and he was again, a cartoon character. And it really took like on, almost engineering to figure it out how the sleeves would stay up. We, you know, we, we built them with like um, boning and then the boning was collapsing. So then we finally found somebody who builds walk around costumes and it was like a pie shaped thin foam. But then we had to have the chest piece build up too. You know, like one of the first fitting that we did with him with the sleeves were so big that we couldn't even see actor's head. You know, so it's those moments where it's actually like this discovery, does it work? It's not working, what's next? You know, that's kind of the most difficult things in, in films when you're doing something you've never done before, you mm -hmm. know? And that's kind of like, uh, you know, doing the painting and the costumes for Haunted Mansion, that kind of stuff. It's, I think that's in each project, there is something like that, that you stumble on, but right. figure it out, you know, I think you figure it out. Is there anything you um, would have known before coming, uh, becoming such a big uh, cost, anything that you would, you would have liked to have known, let's say, before, before getting into this industry, before becoming a costume designer? Like, I wish I, somebody would have told me that, dot, dot, dot. That it's really a journey's, artist journey. You know, that really is not like just the biggest movie you're gonna do. You know, I did one of my most famous movies in the beginning of my career. You know, I kind of got it out of the way. So it's really, <laughs> to me, it's really that it is about the journey, that it really is about craft and, and be getting better and getting, you know, more confident in who you are and be able to solve problems better, you know? So that is kind of something, it would be fun to talk about, about it with someone before I started. I'll, I, maybe I'll be less, you know, impatient or, you know, now I really get it. I mean, every project is like, I get into it. It's about the textures, about everything. It's, you know, I don't have to rush through anything. Right. Now, when you were at FITM, your major, you, you, you got your degree in fashion design. Is that correct? Correct. correct. All right. Yeah. So, and now we have a costume design uh, degree. Do you, um, you know, so my question, I guess, or uh, some people may ask, like, do you recommend that I go through the fashion route and or just the costume route or maybe do both? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if you, if you really want to work on set and do costume design specifically, you should take that course because I think you're learning about uh, craft in the sense of like how to make something, you know, how to make period costumes, history of costume, you know, you put on, uh, plays or shows or whatever, you know, and you, you're creating costume for a particular script or something. So that is very important learning. I think depending of what your also uh, passion is, because if you are very passionate about um, fashion, you should do both because then you can really have a, you know, bigger, bigger kind of form. Yeah of your knowledge and everything else. I actually really love people who come and interview for positions with me who know fashion because mm. it's kind of what I do. So right. you know, the more kind of somebody, somebody savvy and knows designers all over the world and kind of their preference and has their own style, even made things and showed on their Instagram, that informs me more, you know, that's more for me, somebody who would understand my work because that's, I come from that, you know, maybe certain designers would hire somebody who's more really knows about period and exactly right. how things are, you know? So I think it depends on your passion, but I would say the more, you know, I mean, construction is really important. Right. That, it can't hurt. Because it can't you can't hurt. just draw a, a, a costume and go make it. You have to know that it's going to work. That's, right. That you can walk in it. That it's not going to rip. You know, what is it? You can't be impossible. You know, I mean, maybe if you're doing CGI, but not on the real actor. Right. All right. We have one final question. And let's just let's just end with a bang. What is the best piece of advice you wish somebody gave you early on, Miss Bona May? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe don't take no for an answer. Ah. Because I think that, you know, a lot of times somebody says no and you're like, oh, you know, they don't want me or something. And then they walk away, right. Yeah. No, and don't think, walk, don't walk away. Don't walk away. I think that if you want something, go after it, you know, and like, I think that would be, I think for anyone, you know, just follow your dreams and, you know, call five times. Even if you want to reach me, you know, 
call me five times. I want to, <laughs> maybe the sixth time I will. And here we are, you know what I mean? So I think same for me, like when I'm trying to get on certain projects, you know, I'll think of who can I call? Do I know anybody connected or, you know, the producer or somebody that I've worked with and I write an email, Hey, I love this project. You know, can you connect me with someone? Sometimes it doesn't work, but many times it has worked, you know, and I got the meeting for that. I may have maybe not gotten the job, but I did. And I was able to, you know, meet more, uh, directors connect with people so you know I think being very open in a way of of everything and I think kind of part the second part of the that answer would be you know to just really be passionate and you know always read the magazines always you know watch things be kind of really you know read poetry go to the park look at nature you know I think the the light that I was talking about early, this is kind of what can come through your work and what is in art. I think it's kind of like this uplifting thing. And we talk a lot about that when it was inauguration, the beautiful woman wrote the, read the poem. I was uplifted. I was like, this mm -hmm. is poetry. You know? And I think treating life as poetry and kind of the process. And here you are probably artists who are joining us tonight. You know, that is the journey. That is the really the fun thing and kind of who defines us. And, you know, each of you, that joined us tonight has a unique voice and follow that voice. You know, that is really important because if somebody did clueless, not Mona May would be somebody else's clueless, but also a point of view. You know, I got the chance on that one and shine and, you know, I'm so happy this is, this is still, we're talking about it, but each one of you, all of you have something in you to share, you know, and following the dream, you know, going the extra mile, making the extra phone call, fighting for who you are. It's worth it, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm kind of a veteran and I'm still so happy. I get delighted with crazy clothes behind me. And, uh, you know, I wear funny glasses and it's all fun. You know, it's like, that's what's really is fun about life. And I think, you know, any kind of artistic endeavor. So I uh, thank you for all the great questions and, you know, everything just so happy that there's so much interest of you guys and you can always, you know, reach me somehow. I have a great website. You can go to, I still have a website, but because there's a lot of art that you can see that's moving. And follow on. her on it's Mona May at I T S Mona May. That's her Instagram. So make sure to follow her or DM her. Yes. It's <laughs> Mona her. May. It's Mona Everybody, May. So yes. Let me just tell you what Mona May just said right now. That is, that is Mona May all the way. And that is why I absolutely, um, I adore you Aww. to tears. Aww. I, this is, you, I'm so glad that everybody here who um, came to our conversation got to hear and see the Mona May that I know and love and that I wish I could just, you know, give to everybody else. So Mona May, you, 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 you delivered and I miss you. Miss you. Wish I wish I could be in Vancouver, but I don't like the snow that much. No, but, no, no, no. I'm um, coming back. We're having a margarita in my cabana. Add a girl. Add a girl. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, yes, make sure to follow Mona May. You can also follow me at Nick Barrios, and definitely stay tuned. February 9th, we have a fabulous conversation with Bridgerton costume designer. Ellen Mirajnik. That's Incredible talent, you guys. Incredible talent. Incredible. She's, she's a gem. She is at I mean, 5 p.m. Like she's it. amazing, amazing. And then our virtual spring virtual open house, March 20th at 10 a.m. RSVP being placed in the chat. Okay, one last time, everybody. Let's give a big woo woo to the one and only. I wish Mona I could see you all. <laughs> Thank you, Mona. I love Bye. you. Thank love you, you, everybody. Thank Bye. you to everyone. Mona May, you're the queen. Mwah. Love you. Bye. Love you.